Starting a debate about flats versus houses among property investors is like talking about politics at Christmas dinner. Everyone has a strong opinion. And by listening to those strong opinions without questioning them, you could be cutting yourself off from the best investment opportunities for you. I've owned a decent number of both houses and flats for a long time, and we've helped our clients buy thousands of each over the last 10 years. So while, yes, I am just giving you one more opinion, I'm in a pretty good place to assess which arguments are valid, which are not, and whether investing in houses or flats will ultimately leave you better off financially. When we asked our community, the majority came out in favour of houses, which matches what I've noticed over the years. So I'll take houses as the base case for investment, it's something that everyone understands, and talk about the pros and cons of flats in comparison. And at the end, I'll show you how to run the investment numbers for each, which is something else that most people do wrong, and I'll give you a tool to help you with that as well. You'd be surprised how many misconceptions there are about flats, and we'll come to those in a minute. But first, there are some valid problems with them. One is a lack of control. A block of flats will have a freeholder and a management company, and their decisions will affect your investment. For example, say the outside of the block is looking a bit tired. You might want it painted because you're thinking of selling and it'll add to its appeal. But the management company doesn't want to, so it's not going to happen. Or the opposite might happen, they do want to paint it and you'll end up paying even if you think it's unnecessary. But that's not the biggest objection. People also worry about management companies ripping you off and doing a bad job. I think of this as being a bit like plane crashes. They don't happen anywhere near as often as people think, but they're so dramatic they get talked about everywhere when they do happen. I've owned a fair number of flats for a long time and never had a problem, but it could happen and there's no getting away from that. And there's certainly annoyances when it comes to dealing with management companies, like them randomly charging you £100 to give consent for something. It happens. You can do things like collectively exercise the right to manage, which is something you can do by law, which gives residents collectively the ability to appoint and instruct the management company, or even fire them and do everything themselves. But even if you did that, you could still find yourself disagreeing with other residents, which takes you back to the lack of control problem. Another issue is tenant churn. So as a general rule, flats tend to be rented by people who are younger and maybe more transient, especially flats in city centres. So you might expect tenants to leave more often, leaving you with the cost and hassle of replacing them. Again, this is only a general rule. I've got multiple flats where the tenants have been there for more than four years, but as a rule of thumb, I think this holds. So it's something to build into your numbers and I'll show you how to do that later. And then depending on your strategy, there's possibly the biggest drawback of all, which is that you're much more limited to how you could add value to a flat. It's tricky to add an extension, for example. So if that is part of your strategy, flats probably won't work for you. So those are all good reasons, but there are also objections people have to flats that I just don't think stand up. There are three main ones, which are mostly simple mistakes that mean they completely misunderstand flats as an investment. One of these objections, which is rooted in something true, is that every year you receive an invoice asking you for money in exchange for nothing at all. This is called ground rent, which is also an unpleasant reminder that you don't actually own the ground under your flat, you're literally renting it for a number of years. Many people don't like this on a philosophical level, but I think this is mostly silly because if you've got an interest-only mortgage, you don't exactly own the asset either. And even with a freehold house, you'll learn exactly how much control you really do have when you start putting in planning applications. Now for new leases issued from 2022 onwards, there can be no ground rent at all. It's been banned. But if you're buying a flat where the lease was created before 2022, which of course at the moment is the vast majority, there may be ground rent. Although the government is talking about abolishing this in future as well. But if there is, then you just need to factor it into your calculations. If the investment still works after paying it, then it works. There is one super important quirk to this though. Get your solicitor to check that there's nothing nasty in the lease, like ground rent doubling every five to 10 years, which does happen in a minority of cases. And that won't just change your calculations. It'll also probably mean you can't get a mortgage either. So these are ones to definitely avoid. Another objection related to the fact that you don't actually own the land is that the period remaining on your lease is always dropping. Leases are created for a set number of years, and the clock isn't restarted when there's a change of ownership. So if a flat was built 30 years ago with a 100-year lease, and you buy it today, you'll only have 70 years of ownership left. This can become a genuine problem. Once a lease has less than 80 years remaining, it starts causing mortgage issues, affects the value, and it costs a lot more to then extend the lease again. But you don't need to allow this to happen. 
you have an automatic legal right to extend the lease. So you can just do this before it gets too short. And it's not that expensive. As a total ballpark, extending a lease with 90 years remaining and £100 annual ground rent will cost something like four to five thousand pounds plus legal fees. Now, the Conservative government is talking about making changes that'll make the lease extension process easier, cheaper and more transparent, possibly even removing this 80 year cliff edge. And the Labour Party has said if they get elected, they'll do away with leasehold altogether and have something called common hold, which basically means all this notion of years ticking away goes away. So there may be some changes before the next election, and whoever wins the next election, there's almost guaranteed to be more pretty major changes in this area. So make sure you sign up to our free weekly newsletter, Property Pulse, where we'll keep you updated. You'll find the link to subscribe to that down below. But even without these changes, there is an easy way to avoid the issue entirely. Just buy properties where the remaining lease is at least 120 years. That way, you could own the property for 20 years, and then sell it to somebody else who knows that they can own the property for 20 years before it becomes an issue. This will still give you access to the vast majority of flats and it's easy to find out. The lease length should be included in the property listing on Rightmove or Zoopla. If it's not, you can just ask the agent before you view. Another problem people have with flats, which I think is misguided, is the service charge that you have to pay to the managing agent. Unlike ground rent, this isn't a payment for nothing. You receive services in return. This could include the upkeep of fancy communal facilities like a gym or cinema room that adds to the rental value of your property. But it also includes all the other maintenance that would need to be done to any property that you owned. So anything to do with the roof, the drains, the heating system, you'll be paying for it through the service charge. Whereas if you owned a house, you'd be paying it directly. So I don't think it's fair to say it's an extra cost. It's just a different way of paying for the same costs. And here's the thing no one ever talks about. As an investment, it also has the benefit of making your cash flow much more predictable. In a well-run block of flats, the running costs will be relatively consistent from year to year and will include a reserve fund to cover expenses you know are going to come up every so often. Whereas if you own a house, you could have no maintenance expenditure for months, then suddenly be hit with something massive when you least expect it. This also shows up in smaller and less obvious ways. So if the heating in a block of flats stops working and someone's called out to fix it, they might bill 50 quid and it's split between all owners and so you barely notice it. But in the houses I own, it's not uncommon for the same thing to happen and I have to meet the whole cost myself. Speaking of numbers, we've got a free spreadsheet for running the numbers on a property. And you'll see that there's a line to put in the service charge and also an estimate of what percentage of the rent you'll pay out on repairs. You can grab it for free using the link in the description and later on I'll tell you a bit more about how to use it. Let's get to the ultimate question then. Which can you expect to make you better off? There are four things to look at here, and most people completely miss two of them. The first thing to note is that flats tend to be higher yielding. This means that you can charge a higher rent per pound of purchase price, so you end up making a higher return on your investment. Now this is slightly misleading because you also need to factor in, on the one hand, the bite that the service charge takes out of your returns for flats, versus the likely higher repair costs for houses. This makes it basically impossible to make a general comparison, but for my own portfolio, at least the flats end up coming out ahead after you've taken everything into account. But the rent is only one source of return and investing, and over the long term, not even the most important one. So what about capital growth? Well, capital growth is about the same, and that might surprise you because there's a general belief that capital growth for houses is better. But as you can see from this chart, that just hasn't been true for most of the last 20 years. That was the case, at least, until 2020, when suddenly an unprecedented gap opened up between them. No prizes for guessing why. That was COVID, when everyone suddenly started getting into crazy bidding wars for anything with a garden and a home office. My guess would be that given how closely houses and flats have tracked each other historically, we're likely to see a reversion to the mean, with flats performing better than houses for the next few years to bring them back into alignment. And we're seeing the early signs of that now, but this is just an opinion. Another useful feature of flats is that by and large, there's less competition when you buy meaning you can drive harder bargains. Take a lovely Victorian three-bedroom house. The buyer of a property like this could be an investor like you, or a first-time buyer, or a family trading up or down. It could be anyone, basically, which means more competition. Whereas for flats, investors and younger buyers tend to be your only competition. Even first-time buyers predominantly move into three-bedroom houses these days, probably because the average age to buy your first home is now 31, so you're thinking about a family by then. 
So you're not up against so many other bidders. Now, the flip side of this is that you suffer from it when it's time to sell because you've got a smaller pool of potential buyers. But the thing about being an investor is you can be strategic about when you sell. There are times when the market is particularly hot and flats are flying with demand both from lots of other investors and from first-time buyers who are being priced out of larger homes. So you can pick your moment and take advantage of this to mean that you get the benefit on the way in without suffering on the way out. Another factor for flats as an investment is that they should require less time. If you were really calculating the numbers properly, you'd put a price on your time and factor that in. No one does this in reality, but you really should at least try to keep it in mind as a general principle. Now, something I didn't mention when talking about service charges earlier is that everything covered by the service charge is something that you don't need to think about or get involved in. My investment strategy involves holding property for a really long time and waiting for inflation to work its magic. Ideally, I want to do nothing at all and forget I own it for long stretches of time. And I've done another video about how I make my investments super hands-off, which I'll link to in the description. So I'm weird in that I actually enjoy paying service charge invoices because it reminds me of all the things I haven't had to do. Of course, there are outliers. With a big enough portfolio, you'll end up with both houses and flats that turn out to be a right pain for one reason or another, but the principle still holds. So I think what everyone gets wrong in the houses versus flats debate is feeling the need to pick a side and never deviate from it. Sure, there are some strategies like flips and refurbs where houses are probably more suitable. And if you want to be super ultra hands-off, then flats might be more suitable. But personally, I'll continue to be open to both because why would I put a constraint in place that means I could miss a great deal? And as I've said, you'll end up with both dreams and nightmares of both types. So making a top level distinction is as pointless as saying that men are faster runners than women. Even if it's true at a population level, there's so much individual variation that it doesn't mean that betting on the man in any one-on-one -on -one race would necessarily be a winning strategy. So what I do is stay open to any property of any type. Then for anything that catches my eye, I just plug the numbers into a spreadsheet and you can download a simple one from the link in the description below. If it's a flat, enter the service charge, leave insurance blank because it's normally part of the service charge and put in a low-ish percentage for repairs on top. The last one of my flats where I checked the real numbers, it turned out to be 2% of the rent. I normally put in 4 to 5%. If it's a house, then add in insurance of 10 to 20 pounds per month, no service charge and more for repairs. Maybe 8% or so, but again, there's massive variation depending on the type of house and how lucky you are. And there will be huge swings from year to year. Then see what numbers come out and invest accordingly. But before you even think about buying a house or a flat, there's a mistake too many new investors make that ruins their investment from the very start. So keep watching this video to learn a simple method you can use to avoid it every time.